Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is another fantastic spin-off from the wonderful mind of Jim Lawrence in the Scariest Thing in the Woods series. As ever, I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I and Jim do. Please do let us know down below in the comments though what you thought. Please do like and share and help build this channel and community. Don't forget if you're looking to support the show, you can cop yourself a wonderful jumper on the Teespring store which I'll leave in the description box below and you might see a few examples of the uh, choices, obviously different colours available on the store. Um, your support really does help build the channel in terms of my equipment which is on a, long on its last legs and I uh, really do appreciate all the support you can do. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled Modern Wolves. Let's get straight into that. The young woman strides onto the campus. She marvels at the size of this institution. She considered herself more provincial, and she preferred to be surrounded by nature. Instead of so many structures, a beautiful woman by anyone's measure, she preferred her raven hair long, and she dressed professionally, and her clothing is expensive, though functional. The only jewellery she wears is her diamond studs, her Michelle Deco watch and an antique gold pendant that displays a very old coat of arms. The crest was her family's before she was orphaned. They had left her a wealthy woman and she was then made the ward of another wealthy family and needless to say she would not want for anything else. She couldn't and wouldn't accept the life that fate had dealt her, not that she had much of a choice. The man she was supposed to marry, whom she loved dearly and still did, had literally left her at the altar. So now she decided to make a career with a fast track to a law degree. After two years at a community college with a 4.0, she would now finish her bachelor's here at LSU. She was getting familiar with the campus and seeing where her classes were located, and meet any professors she could. Most of her classes were all in criminal justice and sociology, but she had taken one that wasn't on course with her degree. That was French history. Her family was from France and she adored the early history. She was enjoying herself. She had met the professor in her history class and was overjoyed that he could speak French. She entered the building where she would take her law classes, but the only person there was a young grad student. He greets her, saying his name is Richard Stevens and he was a TA. My name is Michelle, she tells him as he smiles. Michelle Darney, and she smiles too. Oh, the she-wolf has arrived, he says. You have been expected. She looks at him in puzzlement, his eyes flashing a golden colour. Why, why would you call me that, she says as she steps back a step. Oh, that's what your professors at the junior college you went to called you. Said you were a real go-getter, on a fast track to a law degree, a real she-wolf. Lawyers are at a time referred to as wolves, plus that pendant you wear. Isn't that a wolf embellished on it? Yes, it is. It's an old family crest, passed down by many generations. I'm sorry. I guess I was just taken back for a moment. I'm new to such a big place. A round of small talk and the man asks her if she would like to get a cup of coffee with him. She accepts. They start across the campus to get that coffee. As they walk and chat, she goes deep into thought. He is handsome, but this would go no further. She only loved one man, and he has refused to marry her. She didn't hate men now. She just had very little use for them. After all, they were only good for two things, and she could always call roadside assistance if she had a flat tyre. It seems nice. So she walked with him and chatted. As they sat at the cafe enjoying their coffee, three men walked up. One immediately notices Michelle and compliments her beauty. She smiles and thanks the man. But he doesn't let that pass. He's very insistent that she leave her friend and join him. Richard rises to his feet to play the protector. The other man, now flanked by his friends, push him back to his chair and says the lady is leaving with us. I look at the three men, smiling, and say I'm very sorry, gentlemen, but Richard here has asked me to join him, and I accept it. Now be good boys and run along. I am not in the mood to entertain you right now. The man that had pushed Richard says, But we are in a mood to be entertained by you. I think you'd be better off coming with me. 
I doubt both those statements, she says sweetly. That I'd be better off with you. Oh, and the one about your ability to think? One of the other men says, the lady has a smart mouth. Then, noticing the gold around her neck, and judging by that piece of gold, she must be rich. The other says, well, rich, and just well experienced, as they all laugh. The first guy says, babe, one night with me, and you will give me that trinket. Michelle gave the man a smile. We, oui, idiot. I suppose you will have to be dealt with. As she put forth her hand, the man takes her hand, and she rises to her feet. Her face grows stern, as golden eyes flash, and then her grip starts to tighten. She bends the man's hand in an awkward position. His countenance chances as the pain becomes more than he can handle. But she doesn't release his hand. The more she increases the pressure, the more he whimpers. A moment later, there is a sickening crack, and she releases him, shoving him back. Bitch, I will see you again, next time, in the dark, the man shouts in pain, as him and his friends back towards the door. There is a pure feral look in those golden eyes, and if you ever come after me at night, it is you that will be surprised, because the pleasure will be mine. Now go on, before I lose my temper. They quickly leave, one holding his badly broken wrist. She excels and turns to her escort, who, during the episode, had left without saying anything. And she sighs, it will be a lonely year. The bar has very dim lighting, as three young men set drinking, cheap whiskey. One of the men is injured, a broken wrist and he received a couple of weeks back. He had told people that it was in a fight with an ISV linebacker, but his friends knew it was a five foot seven petite girl. One of the men leaves, but quickly returns saying, Rick, she's here. Who's here? That girl, you know, your hand. The man known as Rick stands to his feet as she approaches him. He's not sure if he should run or hold his ground. If she beat him up in front of this crowd, he would never live it down. The beautiful dark-haired woman isn't dressed like before. Makeup, short skirt, unbelievably seductive. She gives him that pouty look. I am lonely tonight. I thought I would see if you still wanted to play. Oh, are you afraid of me? She takes a silver flask from a purse and pours the contents into his glass. Perhaps this will give you courage. Remember, I did say you would be surprised, and I would receive the pleasure. She traces it along his face and chin with a long red fingernail. Catch me if you can, and you will have me. She is up and out of the bar in an instant. Rick sits there with a dumbfounded look upon his face. He downs the liquid she poured into his glass. Rick and his two friends run into the street, only to see a single shoe. Woo! This bitch wants to play. Let's go, guys. They quickly find her second shoe. The bar they were at was near the old Spanish fort, and her trowel seems to be headed into the park and bayou. They move towards the park when one catches the sight of a piece of cloth. It's her blouse. They trek into the park. It's hard to believe that a city park could be so forested, but the hunt is on. The next piece of clothing they find is her skirt. They know they are on the right trail and the anticipation has gotten the better of them. They rush headlong into the night, unable to see what awaits them in the dark. Another piece of clothing this time is her bra. The three men call out to her. We're tired of this game. Come out, woman. It's time to finish this. A pair of panties fly into the clearing, along with a deeper voice saying, I'm over here. They rush through the trees and come face to face with not a beautiful woman, but an enormous wolf. The wolf advances on them, but just as it leaps, Rick, the one with the crippled hand, pushes one of his friends between them. The wolf hits him and bowls him into the brush. Rick and the other guy scatter. She thinks how she had never known this one's name as she ripped out his throat. His kicking and screaming stops as she pulls her bloody muzzle back. She thinks to herself how this terrible temper of hers has cost her the only man she loved. How James, ever the paladin, could not accept her murderous nature. How she hoped her time at school would channel that into a more civilised path. These three men had cost her though. They had. Demasculated a man that she liked and caused a rumour to start about her being dangerous. Well, she was dangerous and these that had incurred her wrath would see just how dangerous she could be. A man cannot outrun a wolf, especially a werewolf. The two had split up, but she knew where and which way they went, and who she would kill first. 
She ran off after the second friend, and he was heading towards the lake. She quickly overtook him and was running parallel, and then she cut the track off the man and tripped him. He lay sprawled out on the ground, and she approached slowly. He was on his knees, now begging for his life, saying, We were not going to hurt her. I swear, please, please. I almost feel sorry, but I end his life quickly with a bite to the throat. Now, for the last, and for that one, it will be special. This fool had just taken himself deeper into the forest and was running to exhaustion. I pick up his trail and run him down. This is too easy. He has stopped and is trying to calm his nerves with a cigarette. Before I step into the clearing, I start to transform back to my human form. I step out into the clearing, robed only in the moonlight. Are you tired of our game already? I was hoping you would have more stamina. He shouts to the woman, There is no time for this. There's a huge wolf out there chasing us. I think it already caught... His voice hangs in his throat. He sees the nude body covered in blood of his friends. It was you, he shouts. You're the monster. I look at him, eyes glowing golden in the moonlight. You wanted to rape me and rob me, and God only knows what else, and you call me a monster. I will show you a monster. As I start the transformation, this time not a wolf, but a hunting form, a hybrid form. Muscles grow, and my body enlarges, and white skin becomes black fur, fang, and claw replace tooth and nail. I am in my full form now, fully eight feet tall. I step forward to him. He has already voided himself. I hear the word Rougarou over and over again. I trace a red clawed finger down the side of his face. I told you, you would be surprised, and I would receive the pleasure. One swipe of a clawed hand and his guts empty out onto the forest floor. I know, I should ask God to forgive me, but all I want is for James to forgive me. She walked into the pale lights of the full moon. She loved looking at it. It seemed to empower her, but it also saddened her. The moon reminded her of James. Where are you tonight, my love? What great wrongs do we avenge? Do you miss me as much as I miss you? The sorrow changes to that of her father, how the madness had taken him, and he had died at the hands of a peasant. Why did you not right that wrong, mon amour? She picks up a faint sound, approaching her from behind. She pays it little attention. Her thoughts go to her mother, saddened by the death of her husband, never recovered, and when the monarchy is broken down, and all France desired the blood of the nobles, how they were forced to flee. The cross into the new world was hard. Her mother had died on the ship, and even Lord de Hugh couldn't keep the sailors from trying to bury her at sea. She knew the person who was walking up behind her, she knew his scent. Before he could approach her, she turned. Good evening, Richard. He greets her back with his eyes cast on the ground. Congratulations on making the Dean's List, he says. Thank you, Richard. I see you have found your voice. I thought that except for your lectures in class, you had lost it. I am sorry, Michelle, he says again with his eyes cast on the ground. I'm not a brave man. I guess I never have been. He turns to walk away. I was not concerned about your courage. You were outnumbered, and you would have been injured severely. You were not afraid. You heard one of those thugs. You were impressive. I... I was a coward. No, Richard. I was just as afraid as you were. My guardian made sure I knew how to defend myself. After the death of my parents, I got lucky, and they did not expect a girl to know karate, I guess. Also, they didn't want to rough me up. They had other plans for me. I still live in fear they will cross my path, and I might not be as lucky next time. Oh, you don't know. A couple of months ago they were all found dead by the old Spanish fort. Some kind of animal attack. Some even say they were murdered by the Rougarou. Most likely a drug deal gone bad. Monsters killed by a monster. Very poetic. Oui. A small talk aside, they walk off together to try another cup of coffee. The end of the semester is busy, finals and other activities. Richard acts like her constant companion, and she enjoys the company, but he wants a closer relationship, and she will not allow that. She knows they are of different worlds. She is a predator, while he is prey. She can never take him home. Henri would kill him as he entered the mansion. No, this could go no farther. 
She wasn't sure how she felt about the social aspect of school. She had been asked to join many sororities, and been asked out many times since the story of her being fierce had died down a bit. She found it unusual that humans wanted their women to be weak and protected, that only the men were warriors. She could not help what she was. She enjoyed the power and the freedom. She didn't want to look at humans as if they were cattle. But her entire life she was raised to believe herself superior, and humans merely as workers to provide for her. James he had a sense of duty about him. He saw the worth in the common man, and she knew it in her heart, that if she ever hoped to win him back, she would have to see that worth. She had to become a protector, and not a predator. For the next few weeks, she had all but told Richard that she was not going into any relationship with him. She was being very observant around campus, though this did not set well with her. She was acting more like a dog than a wolf. One day, while she was watching people, she noticed the way people acted. How do we protect these people? She watched until her emotions overcame her, and then, at the top of her voice, screamed, James, how do you do it? A voice behind her calmly said, tell me about him. Tell me what makes the most beautiful woman around so love a man that rejected her. Her stinging words hit Richard like a cold slap in her face. Sheep do not understand the thoughts of wolves. Her cold words hurt him as deeply as if she had raked her claws across his stomach. Richard lowers his head and walks away into the darkness. His only words are, goodbye, Michelle. As she watches him walk away, anger rises in her. She truly was a she-wolf. She will not hunt, but neither will she deny who or what she is. This will be the last man to ever walk away from her, and from now on, they would run. She embraces her true nature, and as soon as she is no longer in anyone's sight, she releases a long, sorrowful howl. Richard thinks about turning around a dozen times, running back to the beautiful woman. He couldn't though. He knew he couldn't compete with that memory. He hears the howl, and his blood freezes. It is both terrible and sorrowful at the same time. He knows he must get to his apartment. He's afraid, and he knows that something dangerous will be hunting tonight. The year passed quickly. Richard had left school, and she thought the entire state. She was in her last year, and a fixture on the Dean's list. She had already been approached, and passed the entrance exam for Loyola where she planned to finish her law degree. She had become very popular of late, and she started keeping company with certain students. It's early February, the year of our law, 2010. While sitting at a cafe with a few friends, the other girls were chattering about Mardi Gras, when a new story interrupts the programming. A Russian dignitary had been on vacation in Canada, when their child had been lost on an excursion. An American forest ranger had been vacationing there also, and he had found the child before the cold or animals had claimed him. Michelle paid very little attention to it. Others' misfortunes normally didn't interest her, until she saw on the screen. Ranger Jim Johnson of the USA had found the child and was being interviewed. Michelle dropped her drink and shouted, James, and told the other people to be quiet so she could listen. One of the other friends asked, who was that? She told them, James DeHue, the man she was supposed to marry. Her friends pressed her the next week for information. The news had said that his name was Jim Johnson, but Michelle was sure it was James. Michelle was not the same after that, more withdrawn and short of temper. Her newfound friends were worried about her and had insisted that she accompany them to Mardi Gras. She at first declined until a young man, Justin, had made it a point to talk to her. He was a sweet boy. He played American football and Michelle admittedly didn't understand the game. And he caught the ball or something like that. That week, they all went to Mardi Gras as a group. Justin wasn't like Richard. He was brave and took the lead in most of everything they did. They enjoyed that first night. They ended up in a rundown bar. Michelle, the only sober one. She had drunk, but the drinks had little effect on her. It was last call. And they were leaving when a group of five men and two women came in, all wearing leather jackets with some sort of crest on it. Michelle had seen men like this before, and she believed they were called bikers, but there was something different about them. The crest on the back of the jacket was a wolf, and she quickly told her friends it was time to leave. 
As they started to leave, one of the men stood in their way. And Justin stands before him, ready. I had said he was brave, though a bit foolish. The leader of the group told him to leave them alone, as he stared into Michelle's golden eyes. We don't want any trouble, he said. Besides, this isn't our night to party. Tomorrow night may be different, though. We always enjoy the company of beautiful ladies that might want to accompany a real man. Michelle says very sweetly, I'm in a company of real men. But I'm also in a company of real wolves. As real as we will ever meet, babe, one of the men states. I doubt that. We, oui, I doubt that very much. As she traces a manicured red fingernail along the side of his face. As Michelle gets ready to go out the following night, she dresses simply. No jewellery, no frills. Justin is upset with her. Why she had to flirt with that trash? She merely informed him. She was just curious. She tried to talk to her friends about going back out to that place, but they were having none of it. They were curious too. The same men were there as they walked in. The leader approached them. So, you like to live dangerously? The party goes on till about midnight. The men tell them that they are leaving to go back to their place and promise the after party would be even more fun. Michelle tells her friends that they want no part of what these men have planned and it's time to go. Her friends balk at the idea. One of the men tells her that all can come, there's plenty of room. Michelle stands before the leader and tells the others, leave right now. I will go with you and this is not open for debate, her golden eyes flashing. Y'all heard the lady, she rides with me. You other bitches get lost. Something deep within him, some tiny voice makes him wonder just who is lost. They ride out of the city to a rural location and stop. Well babe, the party is here, as he looks up to see the full moon rising high in the night. One of the girls says to her, you should not have done this, you're in danger, run away. Michelle stood her ground, I hardly consider myself in any danger. The woman walks away. Suit yourself, bitch. She then hears the first shout of pain and she looks around to see the others stripping off their clothes as the moonlight hits them and their bodies start to contort. She stands there marvelling at the pain and the transformation it's causing them. She says lessers as she herself starts to disrobe. The leader is fully transformed now, standing almost seven feet. Michelle thinks of James and at full height he's fully ten feet. The leader and a harsh voice screams, Why are you not afraid or terrified? Why are you not running? She gives him an unconcerned look, rolling her eyes. It would take much more than a pack of lessers to impress me. Though, I am curious. I have never seen a lesser in a pack before. The pack looks around completely confused as Michelle finishes disrobing. She trembles for a few seconds as her own transformation starts. Her eyes are at first large golden orbs. As her body elongates and muscles grow, pearly white skin is then replaced by black fur. As she grows to a full height, towering over the leader by a better than a foot. The other werewolves stand in awe, staring at her. James would kill them where they stand. To please James, I should kill them where they stand. She approaches the former leader and drives her clawed hand into his stomach. As he drops to his knees, her other clawed hand raises his head up. It would be easy to kill them all, but she has a better idea. If she couldn't be the wife of the man she loved, what better than to be queen? The next day, Michelle's friends see her being dropped off for her class by a man on a motorcycle, and she was not dressed like she usually was. They meet her outside her class, demanding to know why she dumped them last night. I did not dump you. I protected you. From what? A hell of party, by the looks of you. Well, I didn't want you to tarnish your reputation. What about yours, they said, in unison. My reputation? Pfft, <laughs> Michelle said with a laugh. You'll call me the she-wolf, but if you really want to party with those guys, I'm sure they will be there again tonight. Feel free to show up. Oh, are you not going? I'm staying in tonight. I'm a bit tired. That night, Michelle's friends met the biker guys at the dive. Four of them left to go party at their place about midnight. As they walked in the door, they were surprised to see Michelle sitting in an ornate chair. As one said, we thought you were not coming. Then there was an audible sound of the door locking. A moment later, the screaming started, begging Michelle to save them. 
She watched from a chair sipping a goblet of wine. I told you not to come. A few months later, she is walking down the aisle. At her commencement, a full graduate from LSU. On the podium was a picture of four students that had gone missing during the Mardi Gras. She thinks the man this had taken her father, and he was taken down. The madness had also taken Henri's father, and he had to be taken down. Was the madness now upon her? Would she have to be taken down, and would it be James that would take her life? She thinks about her friends. In the old times, missing people were assumed killed by wolves. But in this day and time, I guess it would be modern wolves. Wow, excellent stuff, fantastic stuff. Thank you ever so much, Jim, for your dedication and support, brother. Really, really does help me. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I. As ever, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help smash this channel through to 10,000 subscribers by the 17th of this month, which is my official uh, two-year anniversary from my first upload. Looking forward to a special celebration show, currently writing, uh, halfway through writing a brand new story, hopefully about two hours of audio in length, um, and I'm writing in a special feature for possibly two chapters of a very well-known up-and-coming narrator, uh, I'm just going to speak with him later on tonight to try and finalise his yay or nay on that situation, and I'll give you guys some more details as we get into that, and as ever guys, above all, I hope you're happy and well, and remember, be safe, not sorry.